Blueberry. Blueberry. Blue, totally ignoring me. Hey everybody, Jamie Lee here from Bird Tricks, and today I'm gonna to talk about how to bond with two birds who are housed in the same enclosure. I know that this can be kind of a tricky one, especially for small birds that are really flighty and fearful, um, and neither one wanna come close to you. It can be really difficult. And then when we get into large birds, usually they're kind of both getting aggressive and defensive and protecting each other, and so you're dealing with a whole other scenario between those birds. So I have a solution for both of those scenarios. So stay tuned. My number one tip for working with two birds in the same enclosure is to actually focus on just training one. Now, this happens and presents itself by just naturally understanding that one bird is gonna be braver than the other. In my experience, usually this is the male bird, but not always, so it can really differ. When I worked with some pairs of toco toucans um, on an island in Bahamas with my husband, we were crate training these toucans, and we found that Instinctively, the males were much braver than the females, and these were paired off in couples for breeding. And we needed to be able to train these two hands to go into crates in case of an emergency because a lot of the time, island weather is very unpredictable and people have to get undercover depending on that unpredictability. So in our efforts of crate training these two cans, we found the males were a lot braver and they would actually come into the crates a lot more easily. So we decided to just focus on training the males. What actually happened is the males would come, they would get the blueberry as a reward for going in the crate, they would jump back out and go would deliver the blueberries to the females. It was pretty sweet, but it was very sabotaging as well. <laughs> but my point to all this is that there's always one bird that's more willing to interact, that's braver than the other one. Focus on that bird and kind of chalk it up to the second bird's gonna learn from watching that first. But the faster progress you can make, the more um, incentive that second bird is gonna have. So really just pick one bird and focus on that bird. When you're dealing with untamed birds, you wanna start with hands-off training so that the bird never feels threatened and doesn't feel like it has to A, retreat, or B, bite and attack to defend itself. You never wanna provoke those responses, so we work in a hands-off way so that it's very non-threatening. This can be just you walking by, having an empty dish, as one of the dishes in the cage and just dropping a treat inside. For big birds where you're dropping a seed or a nut and they hear it go into that empty dish, it's going to really resonate with them and almost become a cue where they run over and get that treat. Um, for birds that maybe you can hand the treat through the bars, do that and just start there. You want to just associate yourself positively in a non-threatening way and in a very hands-off way. So if you can hand the bird the treat, that's awesome. If you can't, simply drop it in an empty dish. The birds will start to anticipate seeing you instead of getting nervous about seeing you and feeling like they need to flee or freak out in the cage. Once you have your bird really conditioned to understanding every time they see you, they're getting something awesome, such as a treat, you wanna gently phase that out into target training. Now, target training is just simply teaching a bird to touch the end of a stick. It's not attack that stick, it's not bite it aggressively, it's just simply to touch it. And the reason that we use this is because we can get the bird to go anywhere we want it to go with this technique. That includes out of the cage, inside the cage, and eventually flight training if you want. Now initially, if you've been using luring and your bird is only interested in the treat, you may need to use a little bit of luring to transition to target training. And what that looks like is holding the end of the stick and the treat really close together so that when your bird goes to get the treat, it accidentally bumps the end of the stick, gets a click and gets that treat. Um, and then you slowly phase it out to where the treat's a little further back, the stick is more present, and the bird will eventually understand that touching the end of the stick equals that treat reward. You want to get to the goal of being able to have that treat completely out of view so that that bird understands what the actual behavior is that you want and isn't relying on luring anymore of seeing that reward. 
target training is a great method because you don't have to worry about getting bit and the bird doesn't have to worry about whether or not the situation is going to escalate to a point of needing to bite you. So that's why I really recommend using this technique, especially when you eventually phase out of just training inside the cage and you want to come and train the bird outside of the cage. So please make sure that you set up target training so your bird is 98% awesome at it and hopefully that second more timid bird is learning through observation watching that first braver bird touch the end of the stick and maybe comes over and tries it too so keep in mind even though you're focusing on the braver bird if that second bird comes and offers the behavior definitely take it up on it just don't wait around so if that second bird looks a little bit interested, but is hesitating and hesitating and hesitating, you don't wanna just wait and wait and wait and wait on that bird. Just keep focusing on the main braver bird. The cool thing about observational learning, like I was explaining with those toucans, is that you can train one bird and that just that alone will train the second bird through observational learning of just watching and observing that bird and how it, um, how it gets that treat, that second bird will start doing that same behavior to also get a treat. So it's pretty cool. Instead of training each bird, in, each bird individually, you just focus on the one and the second one just kind of follows suit. The next phase of this training is actually placing perches outside of the cage so that you can eventually transition to moving your bird outside of the cage and working with it there in a larger environment. Um, I would still keep this environment pretty condensed down. I wouldn't do it in a huge open room, especially if these birds are flighty and flighted, um, but you could just close the bedroom door and work in a specific little bedroom. Um, putting perches on the outside of the cage is going to really help keep your bird comfortable because it's going to be close to its safe, safe zone, which is the cage. Um, but it's also going to slowly expand that safe zone bubble outside of the cage and be able to give you opportunity to interact with your bird a little bit more outside of the cage. Some more options for this besides just putting perches on the outside are kind of pushing up play stands or foraging trees, tea stands, Anything that you can kind of prop up against the cage to use to expand that bubble is going to help you work outside of the cage. So make sure that when you implement this, maybe your birds are out and away from the cage so it doesn't possibly scare them or just move really slow when you do go to implement this phase. So the next thing that you need to do to make sure that you're really successful at this next phase of training is designate a specific perch or tea stand um, as your main interaction spot. That's the spot that you want to eventually target train your bird over to so that you can constantly interact and start really doing a lot of things from there. Your bird will learn that as soon as the cage opens, he will go to that spot to, to communicate to you like, hey, I want to interact with you human. And it's a really, really cool form and clear form of communication between you and your bird. The main spot that people go wrong with this is forgetting to target train the bird back in the cage and then out and then in and then out. Don't just target train the bird back in the cage when you need it to go in there and then shut the door for hours. That's what makes birds not wanna go back in the cage is that predictability that they're going to be there for a really long time because you've set up a pattern. Stay away from patterns like that. Other than your bird getting 12 hours of sleep and getting a healthy diet, those are the only patterns you should have. <laughs> um, so be really, really mindful of this because your bird will start to refuse to either go in or refuse to come out based on what patterns you have established. So make sure that when you target your bird back in the cage, you're also asking it to come out and make sure when you're asking your bird to target out of the cage, you also ask it to go back in. You can practice shutting the door for three seconds, shutting the door for one second, shutting the door and letting your bird open the door again. It really needs to have a lot of variety in it so that it doesn't become predictable. Keep in mind with fearful birds, the value of going back in the cage is going to change. So initially, birds that are incredibly fearful are not going to wanna to come out of the cage to interact with you. It's gonna take a lot more incentive, a lot more treat value to get your bird to come out. But as your bird establishes bravery and starts liking to interact with you, it might actually turn around and be different for your bird to now be resistant going back in the cage. So keep in mind how you play with that treat value and reinforcement and how you play with that cage value as it changes. Once you're at that phase where your bird's actually resistant to go back in the cage and wants to stick around and hang out with you, use that designated space we talked about earlier to start trick training, to form a bond and really get to know that bird a lot better. So there's three common mistakes that I see people make with this entire scenario of what I usually recommend to people on my consultations. 
One is trying to take a really big step or make a lot of progression at the end of a training session instead of at the beginning. So for example, if target training is going amazing inside the cage and you're getting towards the end of your session and you decide to open the cage for one last rep or the last three reps, you might be looking at a dead end because if the bird gets out and then spooks, you don't have any more treat value or bravery value or anything that you've actually worked up to to be able to get the bird safely back in without putting hands-on uh, sort of techniques in there. So you don't want to you don't want to do those really big milestones or breakthrough moments at the end of a session intentionally. You want to do those at the beginning. Um, so keep in mind that if you get to that point and target training is awesome, save it for your next session to start maybe with the cage door open next time. Don't do it at the end of the session when you're running out of treat value and motivation. The second mistake I see people make is really large reactions to behaviors. So for example, if the bird's incredibly aggressive and tries to bite, if people go, whoa, or naughty boy, don't do that, and they just have some sort of big reaction where your tone changes, your body language changes, it's really big and, and obvious, um, you wanna keep your reactions, which is hard because they're reactions, not responses, um, you wanna try to keep your reactions really monotone, real chill, you kind of want to have non-reactions for this stuff. That way the bird isn't accidentally reinforced or accidentally punished by your reaction. The third mistake and final mistake I want to leave you guys with that I see people to commonly make is not being set up for the training session before it happens. A lot of people try to set up for the session as it's going. They might go towards the bird and then having to scoot a perch closer or scoot a chair closer and dragging across the ground or whatever you're having to do to set up for your session might distract or scare your bird and throw off your entire session. Make sure that you're set up for success ahead of time and so is your bird. You wanna make sure that you have your treat pouch ready to go, you have your clicker, you have your training stick and you understand what you're trying to accomplish in that session. So just be really ready for that and Think about those last minute things as really derailing your success. So I hope this video helped you guys and gave you some tips and tricks, especially some starting points for how to work with two birds in one cage. Keep in mind that observational learning is really powerful. Don't think of this as ignoring that second bird. Think of it as progressing much faster with the first and giving the second one opportunity to learn at its own pace, which may be much slower, but once it gets there, I'm sure they'll both kind of have a jive and a groove of catching up with each other. A lot of the times when I've tamed two birds at once, uh, one just has strengths in different areas than the other one, and you wouldn't have thought it because that one was kind of second to, to catch up, but birds have a lot to offer, and they're capable of so much, so please don't give up on them. If you find this video helped you, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you guys all next time.